Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. This is episode three of Questions and Answers. In this episode, I'm going to be answering three Lightroom related questions. Before I do that, if you guys could do me a favor, if you hover over this video and you look in the top right hand corner, you'll see an eye. Click on that eye and you'll get some info on how you could help me improve my videos. All right, our first question comes from Melissa. On the thumbnail pictures along the bottom, there is a small circle in the top right hand corner of each picture. When I click on it, nothing happens. What is that circle for? Okay, what Melissa is referring to is down here in the film strip. If you look, you have all your thumbnails of your pictures, and if you hover over one, you'll see that this little circle appears. And she is mentioning that she's clicking on it like I am right now, and nothing appears to be happening. All right, to see what is happening with that, go to the library module. And if you look towards the top where it says catalog, you'll see quick collection. And you'll see that it has one image in the quick collection. I just added it by clicking on that circle. So I could go to all of these images here and click on that circle. And you'll see that it will quickly add them to the quick collection. If I want to remove one from that collection, I could just click on that circle again, and it's removed from the quick collection. So the advantage of this is you could go through all different folders in your computer. Let's say that you have a client and they want to buy a picture of a butterfly, but you have butterflies in multiple folders. So you could go through your folders one by one, and as you run across a butterfly that you think your client might be interested in, you could just click on this little circle. Then go from folder to folder to folder, find all those butterflies that you think they'll be interested in purchasing, and click on the circle. Then you could come up to the quick collection, and there they are. And you have them easy. You could export them or do whatever you need to do. Now another thing you could do is you could convert the quick collection to a regular collection and to do that you just right click on it and you could see it says save quick collection and you click there and you give the collection a name so you're going to give it a name and I'm just going to call it temp and then you have the option of clearing the quick collection after saving now I'm going to turn that off just for a minute because I thought of something else I want to show you while the images are still in the quick collection but if I had that checked once I click save it's going to create the temp collection that I just created, and it's there. And if I had that checked, the quick collection would now be empty. But what I wanted to show you that I should have showed you a second ago is if you are in the quick collection, you want to quickly remove an image from it. All you have to do is click on that little circle again, and you will be removing the images from the quick collection. As simple as that. So you could quickly and easily add or remove images from the quick collection by just uh, clicking on that circle. You also could hit the letter B as in boy on your keyboard and B will toggle that removal or add functionality off and on. So this image right here is not in the quick collection. If I hit B you could see it got added. If I hit B again it got removed. So there's the keyboard shortcut if you don't want to click on that little circle. Just hit the B as in boy key on your keyboard and you'll be good to go. Okay, so that is that question. Let's jump over to Nicole's question. When I'm in the library module, the thumbnails are very small. They look much, lar much larger on your computer. Can you adjust the size? Yes, it's very easy. What Nicole is talking about when she's in the library module and she's in grid view, these uh, images in the in the grid view are very small. Well, if you go down here to this toolbar, this is called the toolbar. If you don't see that, hit the T key on your keyboard and it will toggle it on and off. And you can see at the far right here I have a little slider. This will make the thumbnails larger and smaller. Now if you don't see this little slider, click this little down triangle and make sure that thumbnail size has a check mark next to it and then you'll see it. Now if you don't want to use this slider you could hit the minus key and or equals key on your keyboard. The minus key will make those thumbnails smaller and the equals key will make them 
larger. So you could do that with the keyboard as well. Okay, develop back here. We'll see what Ted has to say. I recently went to Hawaii and forgot to change the time on my camera. Is there a way to change the date and time and all those pictures to the actual time I took them? Yes. Again, we're going to go to the library module. Go to the folder that contains all those images. And then go up here to, well, first select all the ones you want to change. So you could click on one and hit like Command A if you have a Mac to select them all. Or hit Control A if you have a PC to select them all. Then go up to Metadata and you want to go down to Edit Capture Time. Then you'll have this come up. And then you could adjust to a specified date and time. So you could actually come in here and change the time. Let's say the date, um, you know, from May, I could go to June or something like that, the actual day, the 10th, whatever, the year, or I could go and change the actual hour, minute, or second, or AM, PM. So you could come there and you could do that and it will affect every image that is selected down here in the film strip. The other option you have is shift by a set number of times. So if you just shifted time zones, like you went three time zones over, you do it this way, I think, would be easier. And then you could just shift up, let's say, plus three hours, minus three hours, whatever. Uh, change file creation date for each year. You could come right in here and directly type in what you want to change. Uh, so either of these, and then you'll be able to change the actual uh, date and time for all the selected images down here in the film strip. So it's very easy to do. Okay, next question. Okay, this is a longer one. This is from Dick. He's saying, I'm a Nikon shooter and I almost always shoot in .nef format raw. When I'm importing my image into Lightroom 6, a process is taking place that converts my images into .dng format. I can't remember making any changes to my settings for this to happen upon import. Is this something I should be concerned about? Which is best? Are there differences in file sizes? I very seldom make prints. Okay, let's like take this in steps. First of all, let's say we're going to import some images. I could hit Shift-Command-I to import the images. That's a keyboard shortcut if you have a Mac. Shift-Control-I if you have a PC. Other than, If you don't want to do that, you go up to File, Import Photos and Video, or you could go to Library Module, and you could click on this little Import button right there. And we're going to import some images. Now, what's happening with Dick is he has copy as DNG checked up here at the top. So what that means is that his NEF files, his Nikon RAW files, when they get imported, they're going to get converted to a DNG file, and the DNG file is going to be saved. And that is what is going to get loaded into Lightroom's catalog. Now, he's asking me, does he, you know, more or less, does he want to do that? What's the advantages, disadvantage of the, uh, that? Well, there's a lot of kind of you know, advantages, disadvantages of converting to DNG. First of all, DNG, they call it an archival format. And part of the reason why it's considered archival is because when a DNG is created or copied from place to place, there's a checksum embedded in the file. And checksum is something that a computer will use to make sure the file isn't corrupt. So if you're going to archive files, that means store them on a hard drive or store them onto, let's say, a different type of media, maybe even like a, uh, um, a DVD or something like that. When it gets copied, the checksum will be checked to make sure that that copied file is not corrupted. So it's a safer way, maybe, of archiving files. So that's one thing that is often noted as an advantage. In my opinion, I've never had a problem copying files, but you know, you never know. So if you and it's very important that you archive your images and you make sure they're safe, then you may want to convert them to DNG before you archive them. All right, the other thing is um, they're faster. They do tend to load a little faster. And the reason for that one of the reasons, at least for that, and is that they tend to be a little smaller. So uh, if you compare the NEF file against the DNG file, 
the DNG file from what I found with my cameras, depending on which camera I use, will be 10% to 40% smaller. So if it's against my Nikon D800E, which makes very large net files, it tends to be more like 30 or 40% smaller. Whereas with uh, you know my D500, not as much. So um, the file itself tends to be smaller. So those are kind of advantages to converting to DNG. Some of the maybe disadvantages is when you do this import, you're copying as a DNG, your import is going to take longer because Lightroom has to convert your NEF file or your Canon file or whatever. It's going to convert it to a DNG, and that takes time. So your imports take longer. Um, also, when you do edits, if you do an edit on any other RAW file, beside a DNG, the edits get written to the Lightroom catalog, or if you have it set up this way, a sidecar file will be written next to the raw file in the same folder with all your edits. So that means that your original raw file is never getting written to. When files get written to, that's when they tend to get corrupt or corrupted. If the problem or the thing with DNGs is the edits get written directly to the DNG. And when that happens, you run the risk of corrupting the file a little more readily than you would than if you just wrote it to the separate sidecar file or to the Lightroom catalog. Now, I've never corrupted a file, so I guess I've been pretty lucky. So I've never had, you know, encountered that. I have used DNGs a little bit, and I've never had that issue. So it's something, you know, maybe it's up to you, you know, whether you really want to take that into consideration and that's your reason for not using DNGs because the edits are written directly to that file. Um, the other thing is backups may take a little longer. Uh, for example, if you load a, you import a bunch of, uh, let's say I use Nikon, so I import, import a bunch of NEF files and I'm backing those up to the cloud. Now that's going to take a long time for those to get written to the cloud. So they finally get all written to the cloud. Then let's say I edit one of those NEF files. The, the raw file never changes. It will create that XMP file that will be next to it. And the XMP file is very small. And that will quickly get re-backed up, up to the cloud or put up to the cloud. So the backups will with a NEF file or a Canon file or a Fuji file or whatever proprietary RAW file you use, the backups will tend to go much quicker after the first backup is done. With the DNG, since you're writing edits directly to the DNG file, the entire file has to get backed up. So that takes longer, especially if you're backing them up to the cloud. Um, there's also sometimes proprietary functionality in specific raw files that won't get transferred to a DNG. For instance, if you're a Nikon user and you use Active D Lighting, Active D Lighting is a proprietary function of some Nikon cameras. And if you utilize it and then you convert to DNG, it will be lost. You will not transfer Active D Lighting along with it to the DNG file. So that's just Nikon. I know there's a lot. I, Fuji, I can't remember what it is, but I know Fuji has like a, a similar to active D lighting type functionality. And um, I can, I'm sure Canon does too. I'm sure all the major manufacturers have some proprietary something, whether it's for, um, you know, lighting or, you know, whatever, that somehow would get lost when it gets converted to DNG. So really what I suggest you do to decide whether or not you want to convert your files to DNG on import is to just Google, you know, differences between um, DNG files and RAW files or something like that. And look at different articles that talk about all the different pros and cons involved and decide what is best for you. Personally, I don't convert my files. I leave mine as, and I shoot uh, Nikon and Fuji and I just leave them as is. I do not convert them. So that's just my, what works for me. So uh, take that into consideration for yourself. All right. 
I think I answered all those questions, right? Which is best? Are there differences in file size? Yeah, the DNG files tend to be a little smaller, okay? Oh, I very seldom make prints. That's not going to matter. It doesn't matter whether you make prints or not, so it just doesn't matter. Okay. Last question. Is there a way to embed the ISO f-stop and shutter speed on a photo when you export it in Lightroom? Sure. Uh, now, assuming it's there to begin with, uh, and usually it is, most cameras, every camera I know of today, in the metadata of the image that it creates will embed the ISO f-stop and shutter speed. It's also going to embed the, the time it was captured, the date it was captured, and in some cameras it will uh, embed location info. If you want to export that, when you go to export an image, now if you want to export an image, the keyboard shortcut is Shift-Command-E if you have a Mac, Shift-Control-E. If you have a PC, you could also go up to File export okay so we go to this export dialog and if you go down here where it says metadata you can see include all metadata as long as you have that that choice checked and none of these boxes down here checked you'll get all the metadata embedded into the JPEG or TIFF file or whatever it is you export and then for you know whatever your purpose, whatever programs, other applications might read that file, that info will be available to it. Now you could remove personal info, like you know, in mine when I right in my camera when I take a picture, I have my name go in the metadata and copyright info go right into the metadata. I could uh, remove that by clicking that box. I could remove location info. So um, if I took pictures, let's say of my home, and I'm it, it's actually showing my address in that in that info I could remove that location info from my export and a right right keywords is Lightroom hierarchy that doesn't um, doesn't really apply to your question so we'll, we'll just you know not worry about that now there's other choices here you could include copyright info only um, copyright and contact info only and all except camera and camera raw info or as I said click all metadata and then click these boxes of what you don't want to include with all the metadata and that should solve your problem so I think I think if I remember right in Scotty's email to me he was saying that they have like a camera club or something and when people bring in images uh, to the club for maybe um, see you know um, you know for evaluation or for you know uh, critique uh, they'd like to see the ISO and uh, f-stop and shutter speed info so they could better critique the image and is there a way to make sure it's embedded and that's how you do it all right so that's it for this episode of questions and answers um, hope that cleared up everything I know I blabbed and blabbed and blabbed thank you everyone that watches my videos I truly do appreciate it I'll talk to you guys soon.